Okay, coming up will be talked by Niels on the uh, um, getting a 3G network to work. This has been what uh, we've been working quite hard over the last, uh, well, 1.5 years or so, or mostly last year. Um, and uh, it uh, introduced all kinds of new protocols and new acronyms and new standards. So, um, uh, like with any new version of uh, 3GPP technology, everything is called different. Um, and we try to um, add all those new acronyms and new interfaces to our code. Okay, well, Niels. So um, when I started with Osmocom, we had 2G and the next logical step is to support 3G and uh, it's a bit late on the market, but as 3G is phased out <clears throat> for productive use, it makes sense to use the devices uh, for open communities and to be able to use the hardware that has now become cheap. And um, we don't support all of the hardware, but basically the this type of femtocell, sorry for not disconnecting the cable, it's really hard to get it back in once I plug it out. Um, so that's a, a femto cell or a small cell, and it has some advantages, and I'll come back to this. So basically, um, <coughs> this chair is in the way. Same as with the Sysmo BTS, your basic 3G network can look like this. Just your uh, laptop, a cable, and the Nano 3G. And um, so, uh, that's simple enough, but of course it's uh, harder than that. The Nano 3G exposes the IOH interface, which is uh, handy for us. Uh, the traditional 3G, it needs an external RNC, which is sort of like the 2G BSC level, but it's a bit more complex. Uh, the, the H node B, well, the normal one is called the node B. The H node B, or the home node B, it includes the RNC which saves us a lot of work because we don't have to implement the RNC. So what we get is the IOH protocol, which is basically uh, circuit switched and packet switched IU protocols combined. And um, just to explain, uh, in, in 2G, the phone is typically, typically called the MS, uh, I think the, the mobile station or something like that. In, in 3G or UMTS, it's usually called the, um, the UE, the, I think it's the user equipment. So it's it's the same as the, the it's just it's a phone, right? And uh, this is the air interface, and this is my uh, little white box with the Ethernet cable going to my laptop. And uh, I call my laptop the core network. It's not entirely accurate. Uh, the core network is a bit less than what I have on my laptop. But um, basically, now we're going to explore the software side of uh, how we implement 3G. So the IOH, um, I mentioned, it is um, um, it is uh, circuit switched and packet switched IU combined, plus some HNBAP, some uh, attachment protocol for uh, sorry for uh, uh, the femto cell to register with the network, and uh, it all goes over SCTP, uh, contrary to. Um, TCP IP or UDP, it's SCTP based and uh, it's got a really complex uh, ASN1 defined um, uh, software protocol stack. But basically the call control and mobility management on top is the same that we know from 2G uh, with some additions for UMTS which you also can get on 2G networks. So what we get here is IOH all this stuff combined, and we have an H and B gateway, a home node B gateway, which should split this up into circuit switched and packet switched. Circuit switched, just to clarify, is for voice, and packet switched is for data. I don't know if everyone is aware of that. So um, that's why we have the Osmo H and B GW, the Osmo home node B gateway. Uh, it's a fairly simple piece of software, uh, just receives the IOH. Uh, acknowledges the HNBAP, the, uh, where the femtocell registers, and uh, basically ignores that part and just forwards the circuit switched and the packet switched to whoever cares about it. And um, 
the the home node B gateway is part of the well that's the the, the binary and it's actually part of the Osmo IOH uh, project. Trying not to breathe into the mic here is kind of hard. Uh, I don't have a pocket like Harold has. So um, now we have IUCS, um, but where where do we send this? Who talks IUCS? So um, typically we have the Osmo NITB, and this is kind of this. MSC part, but it incorporates the BSC part. If you think a 2G network, there would be a, a, a BSC sitting here talking to the BTS, and the NITB has them combined. So we didn't really have a, a place to plug it. The code was very, well, it, it, was, it looked separate, but there were many uh, uh, threads and spaghetti, you know, reaching into the other parts. So uh, one large part of the 3G work was to separate the uh, the NITB into a proper MSC. We have a separate BSC, but we never had a proper MSC. And um, the nice idea there would be to also have a proper A interface to also, instead of having the NITB and BSC combined, have a separate BSC and an MSC. But um, we didn't have an A interface so far, so the the beginning of 3G for me was to basically destroy the NITB completely. I just cut off all the paths and uh, trying to manage uh, to get the A interface set up, but basically I just, you know, I just uh, if zeroed lots of code away and started re-implementing the 3G, the IUCS part. So that was on a branch, and it still is on a branch. So, um, uh, okay, so some details about configuration, basically, on the Femto cell, uh, for the case of the Nano 3G, you log in with Telnet and your Nano 3G IP address and this port number. You have this on the on the wiki. I will also mention that later. And you just tell it uh, where to find the HMB gateway. So that's the my it happens to be my IP address of the laptop. And then it contacts the HMB gateway. In the log, you would see something like this. Uh, the 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 SCCP gets a connection. That's then the IP address of the um, Nano 3G. Oh yeah, and uh, well, you need to find out the IP address usually from. Uh, well, I sometimes I just watch with Wireshark the the um, the DHCP negotiation or look up at the router or whatever you prefer. I'm not sure if it shows up on our IP access. Uh, no, it doesn't. Anyway, um, and then there's the HNBAP registration, and it shows some serial number that th this box has internally. So then we're attached, and um, now we need to send the stuff somewhere. So that's the Osmo MSC. That's uh, the brand new entity we have. That's basically half the NITB and uh, uh, without the BSC part. And um, the Osmo SGSN, where the MSC is for voice and signaling for voice, and the SGSN is for data. And it's the same Osmo SGSN as for 2G. We, we've had it for a long time. And there we basically added the IUPS and uh, the interface, and then it starts working. And both are part of, so far, the OpenBSC project. Uh, it's still the old name and the yeah the main Git repository, sort of a kind of a kitchen sink. But uh, we will talk about this more in other talks. Anyway, it has the Osmo MSC, the Osmo SGSN, and um, on the master branch is of course the Osmo NITB. But on the VLR 3G branch, it's already an Osmo MSC, and there is no NITB anymore. So. Um, the HNB gateway splits up the traffic to the MSC and SGSN, as I've said before. So how do I tell it uh, where to send it? Um, for me, typically, I don't even have this configuration because the uh, HNB gateway assumes localhost by default. But if I want it on another box, I could just tell it to, st to send IUCS or IUPS to remote addresses. But so... Um, uh, Writing these slides, I looked into my uh, setup and thought, 
oh my, we don't even have a configuration for the remote server. But then I realized, okay, it's the default and just uh, made this up for you here. So um, when uh, the HNB gateway connects, then both the MSC and SGSN, they show this in their log that uh, they have a link from on port so and so and that's how you know that the HNB gateway knows where to find the MSC and SGSN. And um, so um, another big change in the infrastructure is the Osmo HLR. So the NITB used to have subscriber data in it and it used to have a local SQLite database and uh, it used to also block until the SQLite finished looking up subscribers or doing whatever. Um, so that was one big drawback there. And the other drawback there was that it doesn't support UMTS authentication. It doesn't support the, uh, the extended, considered standard authentication way for 3G networks. And um, so uh, at first we thought, yeah, easy enough. But in the end, the right decision was to uh, create the Osmo HLR as a separate entity with its own subscriber database and uh, talking GSUB, our basically a self-invented protocol uh, um, sort of mimicking map. And a uh, great advantage here is, um, Daniel also mentioned it, we can now use the same subscriber data for SGSN and the MSC. And the next great advantage, as I mentioned, as I mentioned, is this doesn't block. So this sends GSUB requests. It has advanced state machines now to talk to the HLR. The HLR can take as long as it wants, and uh, the GSUB message uh, sent back gets handled to uh, serve the subscriber. So the HLR was designed to support UMTS authentication right from the start, and we also have this for 2G networks now and. Uh, just on a separate branch. So that's uh, a bit of future development there already, and it's uh, the reason why you need to check out Git branches to run 3G networks. So um, that's basically how you tell the MSC to uh, where to find the subscriber data. And uh, again, this for me, I just leave this out. It's default on localhost. And uh, on Osmo SGSN, it's the same. It has been existing for a long time already, this external GSUB interface. And um, here's a little detail. As um, Harald mentioned, we have this, uh, I don't know, Harald or Daniel, we have this uh, OpenBSC config file name. Uh, this is now Osmo MSC config by default. So here's the uh, next bit of future. The OpenBSC name, which is kind of confusing with OpenBTS, we are moving away from that uh, as we continue down the road. So, um, yeah. Um, ah, of course, you need to enter subscribers in your HLR uh, database. So, it's uh, so far it's basic uh, SQL. So, here I just insert an MC and a phone number and some. Uh, uh, 3G or uh, say UMTS uh, AKA information, uh, KI and OPC and what have you. So that's just uh, for, for later reference. Um, I won't go too deep into that. So uh, let's take a look at the voice part because we don't do RTP streams in the Osmo MSC. We uh, use the, well, the name is, uh, for historical reasons, Osmo BSC underscore MGCP, because it was a tool for uh, sending RTP through some NAT. And we kind of expanded or repurposed, didn't really change much of it, uh, to use it for 3G. So um, what I do is I have this MGCP gateway, which is kind of a stripped down media gateway, and I just tell it where to send RTP streams. And I also tell the femtocell where to send RTP streams. So basically the RTP goes here and then uh, to the remote side or even back to the same. If this phone is talking to this, the RTP would go here and right back there and 
all I do here is I notice there's a call, who's calling who, and I'm telling this entity where to send the RTP streams. Um, this is again part of the OpenBSC Git repository. Uh, that's the config. So, um, so this MGCP gateway, I think so far is the still the the weakest or the most ad hoc part of our 3G development because um, I haven't really gone into depth because so far I have only been using one 3G uh, uh, home node B. It says BTS, uh, obviously a 2G name, and it has a fixed BTS IP. So I don't know what I don't know yet what. Uh, else we need to change. I think it should be some sort of automatic discovery. We haven't really discussed it yet. But basically, you tell the MGCP gateway, what's my own address? What's the the um, femtocell's address? And where to bind and connect, uh, where to bind and accept connections on the Osmo NMSC side. Uh, yeah. And there's also a common number that both sides, the MGCP gateway and the Osmo MSC, no, I don't know. Anyway, there's a base port number on which RTP streams get added. So like the first RTP stream would be on, I think, 4000 or 4002, and the next call would go on, on 4004 and so on. So there's a another configuration item uh, negotiating which ports to use for RTP streams. So some detail. and. Um, the MSC just needs to know where to send the instructions to direct RTP streams. So there's that. Um, this is, yeah, the slide says it all. And uh, the data part, again, uses the Osmo SGSN that we've seen uh, from Daniel's talk and the same Osmo GGSN and his um, uh, remote access option using the external HLR. And um, this is the GGSN is in the open GGSN Git repository. Now there's uh, one thing missing, at, like a quiz question. Can anyone see what's missing in this graph for uh, packet switched data communication? So we have this very nice line here. It says GTPC, that's the GTP control flow the G, where what about the user data where is the actual uh, data communication coming so that one goes directly from the femtocell to the ggsn so it's a kind of uh, new thing so in the negotiation the sgsn tells the femtocell where to send its user data and uh, it's can be kind of tricky in case of uh, first packets and the stuff not being established yet, and the same issue with uh, dropping packets for establishing the link. But uh, that's basically how it works. And the consequence is that um, network communication-wise, the open GGSN technically has to sit over here. So it has to be reachable by the femtocell. You can't have this on. Uh, a loopback interface 127002 or something because then your femtocell won't be able to deliver um, the user data. And again, the same thing as in Daniel's talk, the, due to the GTP specifications, uh, they share the same port number, so they have to have separate IP addresses. And um, let's see what I have on the slide. So uh, I have to add on my public interface a, a second IP address. Maybe you might remember I had 132 before, and I just uh, IP address added another IP address for specifically for the GGSN. And um, here, uh, as before, the SGSN was 127001, and the GGSN was 127002 in Daniel's talk. These, uh, well, the SGSN wouldn't have to be public, but uh, while I was at it, I probably just picked a public one. This is the important one, is a separate IP address on the public interface. Yeah, could probably be a bit simpler, but that's how I use my local setup currently. So um, that's the whole picture again, voice and data. 
we have uh, the femto small cell, the HMB gateway, and uh, the MSC and the RTP control gateway, sort of, for voice, and the SGSN and GGSN with direct GTPU connection to the femto cell, both using the HLR home location register for uh, authentication data. Yeah, so um, that's just uh, some links for later reference. I don't know how, what's the time? Yeah, do you guys have questions? Maybe I can skip this and you can just read this up yourself. Um, ah, one thing I would mention, this is the future picture. Due to the dotty graphs, stuff got swapped around now. I tried to fix it up back, but in the end I just left it like this. This is the same picture that we saw before. And the plan now is to allow 3G and 2G operation at the same time. No NITB involved. We have our uh, uh, stock Osmo BSC as we had before with a proper A interface now, which is currently in development. Uh, Philip is doing that. Uh, the same old SGSN connection. Now the remote HLR and the now standard VLR HLR connection. I didn't mention before the VLR is the traditional name for the part that talks to the HLR. And so this is going to be Osmocom in, in hopefully the pretty near future, where we can operate 3G and 2G at the same time. Yeah, so I'm through there. Um, any questions? I see one in the back. Hi there. Um, I see no uh, configuration interface on the 3G, so the typical TR69 type interface you've got for CPEs in 3G. How are you doing the configuration of the femtosa? Um Yeah, it was mentioned very briefly on the summer near the start. So um, there's much more in, in this DMI, but this is femtocell specific. So basically what you tell the femtocell is where to find the HMB gateway plus which IMSIs to allow and uh, uh, the, the RFCN and I, I kept it short because there are different models of Femtosa, and this particular one uses this DMI model. I guess others have web interfaces or what have you, but that's the, that basically depends on your 3G cell. Yeah, so what what we're using right now, the Nano 3G has this particular config interface. We have some other small cell hardware that has its own MIP in a different format. Um, there's no, uh, we, we don't try to implement TR 069 um, in, 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 in our uh, code. I mean, there are other projects out there that do uh, TR 069. Um, I know that some people have been working on uh, using Huawei femtocells uh, with some Python TR69 code uh, to get the, the basically the, the configuration done. But basically, we only pick it up at the point where you actually see the IUH uh, with the, with the, the, the um, RUA protocol and so on. Uh, I was just wondering if anybody's got any advice of, of where you can actually get femtocells from. How do you <laughs> oh, uh, I forgot to mention, we recently, maybe you um, noticed that we recently launched the Accelerate 3G5 project where we gave away a number of these Nano 3G femtocells. Um, so some of the people that received one are also here today and uh, it's also on the links page. That's where I wanted to plug it, now I remember. So... Um, if you look at this wiki page, you will see the submissions and the projects for 3G sort of in return for receiving a free femtocell. And I don't know if Harald wants to say some more. But. Yeah, so um, we have been trying for, I think, four years now to try to buy femtocells from femtocell manufacturers. Yeah, um, it's relatively difficult um, unless you want to buy 100,000 of them. Um, 
Uh, we even got to some point where we bought 10 samples and we filled out lengthy and lengthy Excel spreadsheets with all the configuration stuff that they should be provisioned with and then they never got back. So we have 10 units that are just brick which we bought um, because they, they didn't follow up with, with the, the, the provisioning of those devices actually so we could use them. So that's been basically a pretty difficult route. Um, uh, what we have uh, basically at Sysmocom is we have a, a certain supply of these Nano 3G devices uh, of which we, I don't know the exact figure, but I think some 30 or something we basically donated to people uh, who wanted to do something to contribute to the code. And um, additional devices from this Nano 3G stock that we have, uh, we uh, will be offering an, a network in the box uh, uh, product basically, uh, which is a small embedded Linux system together with the uh, with the Nano 3G, like uh, we do a Sysmocom uh, with the the Sysmo VTS net, uh, like a starter kit uh, that that you can obtain. So that is not ready yet because well, all the software lives in branches and it's not properly packaged yet and so on. But that will be released very soon now. So we're in the packaging process right now and that will be available. Where other suppliers for femto cells and where you can get them, as I said, it's difficult. Um, uh, we are able to also sell some small cell hardware, which is uh, at Sysmocom, which is compatible with the stack, but also that has been rather difficult to find um, uh, companies and, and suppliers for that. So, um, and if you go beyond the femto cells, uh, the pricing, of course, also again is, is rather expensive. Uh, but uh, as I said, I mean, this is not a Sysmocom advertisement uh, um, uh, event here. Um, but yeah, we have managed to obtain some stuff and we, we are able to, to uh, fulfill customer requests. But where in general on the market you find femto cells, it's, it's relatively difficult. Yeah. <laughs> well, for the Nano 3G, well, it's clear who is the manufacturer. Um, but for the other devices, I mean, uh, basically, we, I mean, at Sysmocom, we subsidize our development by selling hardware. So we don't really like to disclose the identity of, of, of such suppliers because that's basically what we pay our developers from, um, that so knowledge. You will be able to deliver in, you know, like like that. Yeah, of course. There's no problem whatsoever. Um, that's no problem. Okay. Good. Then I think we've run out of time. Uh, thanks to Niels for his work and the presentation. <laughs>